All right, welcome back everybody to another episode of uh, uh, History here on YouTube with my account. Uh, hopefully all of you have enjoyed the video so far, and uh, today what we're going to be discussing is the secession crisis that emerges in 1860. Uh, for those of you new to the channel or who don't know me, um, one thing I will point out is, uh, as a historian, my area of specialty is the American Civil War. And so I thought, what better way to kind of open up this channel after the presidential tier list than to dive into some Civil War-related topics. And essentially what I'm going to do is create about a 10-15 minute long video, not very long, just kind of diving into today, the secession crisis, but other topics throughout history. So hopefully you all will enjoy and you'll learn a little bit of information. Uh, with that said, if you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button, comment below, as well as uh, subscribe to the channel. But anyways, with that said, let's go ahead and get started with uh, today's topic over the secession crisis that emerged in 1860 um, as well as 1861. The secession crisis begins in December of 1860 and it lasts well into 1861. And so today, I really wanted to dive into why does the secession crisis uh, begin to emerge? Why do we see uh, seven and then later on uh, four more southern states secede from the Union? What event triggered it? Ultimately, what issues motivated these southern uh, secession, not just commissioners, but delegates, to vote in favor of secession? And so today I'm going to dive into a lot of primary documents, kind of look at the root of the causes, and ultimately see why do the southern states secede. Now, this uh, topic of why the South seceded from the war, or even you could say it a little bit larger, what were the causes to the American Civil War, is very controversial within today's uh, modern sphere. Largely because we see that uh, individuals go off into one of two camps. They either go off into the states' rights argument, stating that the uh, southern states seceded from the Union because they were trying to defend their states' rights. Or as we see others typically take the other side of the argument and state that the southern states had seceded over the issue of slavery because they wanted to preserve that institution. And so today, going into this video, I'm going to be addressing my opinions on the subject providing primary documentation to support my thesis, and then ultimately try to bring light to this uh, controversial topic to try to see what really caused the American Civil War. Now, ultimately, what we started to see develop by 1860, if we kind of briefly recap what had occurred in the uh, roughly decade prior in American history, we slowly started to see that sectionalism began to grip the nation. And what do I mean by sectionalism? Well, essentially what I mean is we started to see that there was this divide between the North and the South along economic, political, as well as social grounds. And ultimately what we had started to see develop in Congress is there were more calls from Southerners that their states' rights were being threatened, and ultimately they would also threaten um, secession on numerous occasions in 1850 or in the Compromise of 1850, even in the light of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And effectively we had started to see that slowly over time throughout each of these issues, the Southerners were slowly inching towards secession. However, what was the basis of their arguments? What rights were they stating were being uh, threatened um, by the federal government? Well, to kind of put it short, it'd be over the institution of slavery. As we'll see with the primary documents today, many of these Southerners felt threatened, especially by the election of Abraham Lincoln in November of 1860, that they would lose the institution of slavery. Ultimately, what we'd see is the election of 1860. Obviously, the campaign begins a little bit earlier in the year. And what we're going to ultimately see is that this would be the second election that we see the Republican Party, this uh, almost anti-slavery party, emerge on the national stage. And they're going to nominate Abraham Lincoln. Now, ultimately, Abraham Lincoln, he's not going to call for outright abolition within his campaign. However, Southerners are going to see his party as well as his platform as one that's threatening to their institution. They believe that if he were to be elected to the uh, presidency, that ultimately um, the first day in office, he would end the institution of slavery. Meanwhile, running against Lincoln, we'd see that uh, the Democrats were essentially split over who they would nominate for the presidency. Now, largely by this time, we'd see the Democratic Party had become the almost pro-slavery party. We saw both Northerners as well as Southerners would adamantly defend the institution of slavery within the Democratic Party. However, by 1860, we started to see that those feelings began to cool off. We started to see that Northerners were becoming, uh, Northern Democrats, I should say, were becoming wary of the Southern arguments, especially these fire eaters. 
and therefore they were not as hot on the topic of allowing slavery, especially in its expansion westward. Now, ultimately, what we're going to see is that at the Democratic National Convention, both the Southern as well as the Northern Democrats are going to be split over who they should nominate. And ultimately, what we're going to see is they're going to nominate their own individual candidates. We'll see that Northern Democrats would nominate Stephen Douglas, while we'll see Southern Democrats would nominate um, John C. Breckinridge. We'll also see that a third party would also emerge, a fourth candidate on the ticket, that of John Bell, who would run as a part of the Constitutional um, Party. Now, effectively, what we're going to see is that by splitting up their vote, the Democrats are almost going to doom themselves uh, within the upcoming election. And as a result, despite the fact that none of the candidates had uh, gained a majority in the popular vote, we ultimately see that Lincoln is going to sweep the North and with it gain the electoral majority um, in order to gain the presidency. And with Lincoln's election, when we start to see as Southerners believe their institution of slavery was threatened, and they believe that they did not do anything, that the first day that Lincoln takes office in March of 1861, they would see to the end of their institution within the South. And quickly, what we're going to see, as I mentioned before, this would prove to be the last straw. We'll see in South Carolina, um, delegates would call for a special secession convention to vote on articles of secession and break apart the Union, something that they've threatened before, but now they would finally act upon. And ultimately, what we're going to see is South Carolina on December 20th, 1860, would vote unanimously to break away from the Union. Mostly at the convention, we'd see fire eaters who believed that Lincoln, once again, would free all the slaves the first day he was within office. And as a result, what we'd see is they would start a domino effect as we started to quickly see that word of their secession quickly spread across the Union. Now, once South Carolina has seceded from the Union, what we're going to quickly see is, as I mentioned before, word is going to spread all across the, um, the South. And likewise, we'd see that six other states are going to call up their own secession conventions to have their delegates vote on an ordinance of secession to further break apart the Union. And we'll see much of this is going to be confined to the Deep South in states like Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia. And ultimately what we're going to see is that as they debated over, um, over uh, articles of secession, is they're going to proclaim their causes. They're going to listen to speakers that are going to try to invigorate what the cause of this crisis is and why the Southerners should ultimately secede from the Union. And ultimately, what we'll see is many of these speakers at these conventions are going to come from South Carolina. What we're going to see is shortly after South Carolina has seceded, we're going to see that several secession commissioners are going to follow in their wakes and try to ignite further secession fever by pointing out what they saw as a quintessential issue and why they had seceded from the Union. And so with that said, let's take a look at a, a document from uh, Judge William Harris from South Carolina, who would speak before the Georgia Convention in 1861. He would state that our fathers made this a government for the white man, rejecting the Negro as an ignorant, inferior, barbarian race, incapable of self-government, and not therefore entitled to be associated with the white man upon terms of civil, political, or social equality. This new administration comes into power under the solemn pledge to overturn and strike down this great feature of our union, without which it would never have been formed, and to substitute in its stead their new theory of the universal equality of the black and white races. Therefore, as you can easily see through the words of uh, Judge William Harris, what were the true causes of secession? Likewise, you'd see on conventions all across the Deep South, similar rhetoric would be spewed by other secession commissioners. Ultimately, what we'd see in the light of hearing such speeches, we'd see the assemblies and the delegates erupt in applause and their approval of what they saw as the main cause of why they should break away from the Union and form their own independent nation. Effectively, through such rhetoric, what we'll see is by February 1st of 1861, six other southern states had voted to secede. The states of uh, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, as well as Georgia have voted to break away from the Union. Ultimately, we'd seen this first wave of secession. They would quickly look to form their own independent nation. On February 4th, 1861, we'll see that roughly 50 delegates from all of these states that had recently voted on secession would effectively meet to begin to form their own government, one that they believe would represent their ideas. And as we'll see through the formation of their government, 
ultimately we'll see that the institution of slavery played centerfold within the foundations of their ideas of a nation. Now, when these delegates met in February of uh, 1861, they're going to quickly begin to create a government. However, if you look at the uh, Confederate Constitution, the document that's ultimately going to form the Confederate government, what we'd ultimately see is that it looks strikingly similar to the U.S. government. However, there's two major changes that they're going to adopt within their uh, Confederate Constitution. The first, ma uh, first major one is they're going to limit the power of the, uh, the president. Now, under the U.S. Constitution, traditionally, we'd see presidents would uh, serve a four-year term. And then they could therefore be reelected. And at this point, they could be reelected for the rest of their lives if they pleased. However, in the Confederate Constitution, what we're going to see is they're going to change this from a four-year term to a six-year term. However, the uh, whoever was elected president could only serve one term in office. Therefore, they would limit his authority. However, the other major difference that you'd see within the Confederate Constitution from the U.S. Constitution is no less than ten times there would be the mention of the institution of slavery. And why is this important to our narrative? Because it specifically demonstrates that with these two documents, the Confederate Constitution as well as the U.S. Constitution being so similar, that ultimately the Confederates created their new constitution to protect that institution of slavery, something that was not mentioned once within the uh, current U.S. Uh, Constitution. Therefore, we'll even see that further rhetoric would be spewed once they've created their new government, of what the reason for creating such a government was. And so with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at what the new vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens of Georgia, what he had to say of what the reason for creating this new government was. In his infamous um, cornerstone speech, what we're going to see is Vice President Stevens is going to state that the um, cornerstone of the Confederacy and the reason they founded this new government was based on of this quotation. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas. Its foundations are laid. Its cornerstones rest upon the great tr truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural moral condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. This truth has been slow in the process of its development, like all other truths in the various departments of science. Pretty harsh words, as we can see. And clearly... Looking at the cornerstone speech, we see that the vice president of the Confederacy, essentially the second, um, the second man in charge of the Confederate government, clearly dictates what was the foundation of their new government. Now, there will be times that Lincoln will try to compromise in the ensuing months with the southern states and try to quell the secession crisis. However, ultimately, what we're going to see is those um, opportunities that compromise are going to fail. So, as I mentioned before, all these Southerners believe that the first day in office, he would ultimately free all the slaves. However, effectively, what we're going to see is they're going to ignore his pleas, and with it, they're going to continue to rip apart the nation effectively, as we can see clearly through the documentation, and there's more documents that can back up the thesis. The true causes of secession center around the institution of slavery. As we'll ultimately see in the ensuing months, more Southern states would secede. With similar rhetoric being spewed at the Virginia, North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, as well as the um, Arkansas secession conventions. Ultimately, as we'll see throughout the course of the American Civil War, they would staunchly try to defend the institution of slavery. And after the war, they would try to defend in this ideology of white supremacy. With it, as we'll see, we'll start to dive more into the American Civil War and how the secession crisis centered around the institution of slavery, is going to inaugurate the bloodiest war in American history to where we'll see over 750,000 Americans die over the course of the next four years. But anyways, with that said, I hope everybody's enjoyed this video over just kind of a brief discussion over the secession crisis that emerged in 1860 as well as 1861. And with it, when we meet back next time, we'll talk a little bit more about the American Civil War, go into some of the battles, go into the background to the political atmosphere, what was going on on both fronts. And I'm very much excited to talk about all of those topics. But anyways, in the meantime, please like and uh, comment on this video as well as subscribe to the channel. Um, uh, please leave your uh, comments below. I definitely love a, a great discussion, especially in regards to the American Civil War. And... Um, uh, with that said, I'll go ahead and end this video, and everybody have a good rest of your day.